Hi, I'm Yaakov Katz, and welcome to the Jewish People Policy Institute's Inside Analysis of the State of Affairs in Israel and the Jewish World. There's no hiding the growing divide and rift right now between Israel and the United States. It's totally out in the open after the decision earlier this week by the U.S. and the Biden administration to abstain at the U.N. Security Council on a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. And then there was the subsequent decision by the government of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu not to dispatch a delegation to Washington, D.C., which was supposed to be participated with by Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer and National Security Advisor Zahri Anegbi to come to the U.S. and discuss with the Americans the pending Rafa operation. I couldn't be joined by two people who are better equipped to discuss this very urgent and important topic. Ambassador Dennis Ross is the co-chairman of JPPI's board of directors and a member of consecutive and prior Democrat uh, administrations in the United States, and Professor Yadidia Stern, the president of JPPI. So Dennis and Yadidia, thank you both for joining me today. Dennis, I would like to start with you and look at how this is really being viewed in Washington right now. The decision by Netanyahu, obviously, to cancel that uh, delegation. Now it's back on the table, apparently. A delegation might be coming sometime in the next few days. But also just looking at the bigger, wider issue at hand, which is, is do we really have to fight with one another? Well, the short answer is no. <laughs> and yet, uh, we're seeing a reality here. Now, partly, I would say, in terms of President Biden, it's an election year. His own base within the Democratic Party uh, has real problems with uh, the character and scope of his support for Israel, uh, real problems with the way they see Israel conducting the war and so forth. So he is feeling a need to, to demonstrate that he's not indifferent to the combination of the humanitarian conditions within Gaza uh, but also he wants to show that his approach to, to Israel, where he was embracing Israel, showed this is the right way, uh, this is the right way to approach Israel. The reality is also that there's a, a very profound shift in public opinion in the country tilting against Israel right now. There's a Gallup poll out uh, from yesterday that shows that 55% of the American public does not support Israel and Gaza. It's quite extraordinary. Here we are almost six months after October 7th. Uh, and, and to see that kind of a shift uh, is pretty extraordinary. So it's it's not a huge surprise to me uh, that you would see the administration try to position itself at least a little differently. But I would also say, you know, it's, and I'll let you address this. There's obviously a set of political considerations on the Israeli side as well. Uh, one of the interesting things is that while the prime minister made a decision in response to the abstention not to send the delegation, uh, there was already an Israeli delegation here headed by the minister of defense with his, uh, his most senior assistants as well. Uh, and of course, what did they talk about? They talked about the issue of Rafa and what the operation could be. That was supposed to be the whole purpose of this other delegation going. So it's not as if the substance of what was supposed to be discussed wasn't addressed anyway. Uh, there's a kind of uh, interesting political positioning, I guess, on both sides. Uh, and I would just say that uh, while there is obviously a set of political considerations in Israel, one factor that should shape some of the Israeli decisions should be not just where President Biden's coming from, but what's happening in the U.S. as a whole. So you did, yeah, on that on that point, you know, in here in Israel, I, I wonder if you'll agree with me. Most Israelis understand the vital and almost existential importance of the U.S. Israel relationship and how we need friends and America is our closest friend and everyone's hearts were warmed back when President Biden made that historic wartime visit to Israel uh, early in October, just a couple weeks into the war. But on the other hand. It's very easy for a politician like Netanyahu, who's seasoned like Netanyahu, who's been down this road before with prior presidents like Netanyahu, to shift the way that president is perceived and turn it into an instance of where you need me 
and Dennis kind of hinted to the political interest, you need me, the strong Israeli leader, to stand up to that so-called, and I put these, you know, parentheses, or quotation marks, sorry, the, the, the hostile, you know, foreign leader who's trying to tell us what to do. Yeah, I agree with uh, Dennis' analysis. And it's like uh, the same situation here in Israel. As Henry Kissinger used to say, there's no foreign policy to Israel, only domestic policy. This is a perfect example of what's going on right now. It's clearly this is for domestic uh, purposes. Netanyahu knows that right now about 70%, 70% of Israelis do not trust him and his government. And he leads the country into a war right now. And he's trying to formulate a bigger camp behind him. And his way of doing it is pushing a policy that most Israelis agree with. They do not trust him, but they agree with his policy. So one way of doing it is to try to push forward the policy without fighting with friends and allies, but he will not get enough credit for that. So besides of pushing the policy, he and the Israelis think is the right policy is also adding to it some kind of, a, I would say, a public debate. If you ask me, not in a smart way, I understand the reason, but not in a smart way when you think about the general interest of the best interest of the state of Israel. And uh, we are paying price for it. Uh, right now, when we ask JPV, I ask Israelis, what do you think should be the Israeli response to the way America is treating us right now? We asked it last week, actually. The answer is that about 45% saying Israel should stay with their own uh, goals, with our own goals, and do not, uh, if America is not agreeing, that's fine with America, we should not uh, consider it seriously. Another 41% saying, well, only when it comes to national security, we should fight with America, but not on the rest of it. Take, for example, the issue of the humanitarian aid. I think Israelis can really understand that uh, besides of being Jewish and human, it's also our political interest to be responsible to give humanitarian aid through Ashdod, through, uh, through Israel, to Gaza, and find a way of doing it. It will be a win-win-win situation. But I think uh, this is one example of how Netanyahu is using uh, the, the, the anger of Israelis and the, also the threat that if they feel from Gaza and uh, inciting a problem where you don't need it. You know, what, what, what I kept on thinking about this past week is that only imagine, and I think all three of us can imagine this happening, if Netanyahu was in the opposition right now and you had a, the Bennett Lapid government in office and they would be sending a delegation to coordinate with the Biden administration, the operation in Rafa, what what would Netanyahu be saying? He'd be like, oh, this is a great thing. He'd be saying, you guys are betraying Israel. You're going to America. America's dictator. I mean, like, it's a whole twist on things, but that's the cynicism, I guess, of, of, of Israeli politics. So, Dennis, you know, the thing that I keep on thinking about, though, is that Americans are smart. They, they they understand the big picture. They know that Hamas needs to be defeated. They know that Hamas, whatever defeat means and victory means is a separate Man. question. They know that they know that Rafa is important. They see the strategic value. They know there are those battalions there. They know that there are the tunnels along the border there. Yes, there are the displaced Palestinians who were pushed down there in the initial days of the war when Israel sent them from the north to the south. But why are they trying to, and some people would say, chain Israel's hands here? And, and, and not want Israel to go in there and get the job done? I, I think if you listen carefully to what the administration is saying, they agree exactly with, what, with the premise of your question, not so much that they are trying to prevent Israel from doing it, but that they agree on the strategic objective. The strategic objective, by the way, includes having to deal with Rafa. The administration has been very clear, we agree, you have to deal with Rafa. By the way, their approach to Rafa goes beyond only the four battalions. Because you take care of the poor battalions, but you haven't taken care of Rafa and the Philadelphia Corridor Batons. with a clear, uh, basically with a clear plan, mechanism, and program to ensure that this can't be a border that is a sieve, underground and above ground. So they, they look at both dimensions of it, but their concern is you've got 1.3 to 1.4 million Palestinians crammed in there, and they don't see how the Israelis can carry out the operation there without a, a human debacle. So what they're saying is, come and, and lay out your plan uh, in terms of evacuation, and we will 
we we have some ideas about how militarily you can deal with those battalions. Let's talk about it. I will say, you know, I would be more impressed with Prime Minister Netanyahu's position on he has to say this and what the U.S. did, you know, strengthened Hamas and made them think that, uh, you know, that, that, that Israel's hands were going to be tied. I would be more impressed with what he was saying if everything he was saying wasn't just words. If he wanted to send a message to Hamas that this was for real, why isn't Israel evacuating the people from Gaza now? The minute right. they would start evacuating, that practicality would send a message that they're getting ready to do this. But there is no evacuation taking place. So it's it's a little hard to take some of the words seriously. And to be to be fair, the administration is also looking at that way. We keep hearing from you, you have these plans, yet when we ask to see them, they're not presented to us. You know, if you want to reassure us about what you're going to do, <laughs> then go ahead and reassure us. Now, I will say this. I do believe that uh, Tony Blinken, when he was in Israel last week, felt he had good discussions. And I and I can tell you, I know that Gallant, who was here, uh, also feels, and the administration feels, they had good discussions. So you have this, you have this public presentation, and I will say public noise, you have some practical discussions going on. Uh, I would just underpin what I said. If Bibi was really serious about signaling Hamas, then he would begin the process of evacuations, because that would be very clear that, okay, we're getting ready to do this. And by the way, I mean, we all know that Israel knows very well how to do that. All they got to do is fly a couple of planes over that area, drop a couple, you know, hundred thousands or millions of flyers. That's a that's a clear way to start moving in that direction. But Yadidia, to that point, though, then it's hard to escape the feeling that Netanyahu is playing a political game right now, a, a, a solely political game, one that he reads the polls, not just JPPI's polls, but other polls that also show that he will lose an election. He's got the Haredi breathing down his neck right now, the ultra-Orthodox over the draft bill, that they're not getting to a compromise. And it, it, the irony is that even with the failure of October 7th, what might bring down this government is that age-old issue that has just never been dealt with in the in, in throughout Israeli history, the I, the draft of uh, of Haredim into the IDF. So is it is it more for him now? How do I stay in power over? How do I de defeat Hamas and preserve the relationship with the United States? Well, I really do not understand why he didn't move on Rafa earlier. It's, a, it's already two months. And why he didn't move uh, the Palestinians to the center or to Mwasi area or any other solution, as, as Dennis just said, it's not clear to me. So it comes to mind, and I want to be careful, but it comes to mind that there is another ulterior motive. So what might it be, Yaakov? One major motive might be to extend the situation in order to uh, stay in power. Because it's quite clear to everybody that once the military operation will end up, whatever way, uh, the masses in Israel will start, you know, a process, a civil process of, uh, of asking ourselves who should be our leader, who should pay the price for the failure on 7th of October, and eventually it will come. Now, in a way, I think Netanyahu is right from his point of view. Obviously, I'm not supporting it because we see a slight change in the public opinion in Israel, and he's trying to gain more and more, a little bit support from the people. More and more people are more convinced today that the Tzahal IDF and the secret services are responsible for the failure, and not necessarily the government. And maybe he's playing this echo, you know, trying to be the strong leader on one hand versus the Americans, and on the other hand, not pushing forward to finish it. Uh, if this is the case, this is obviously very upsetting. Obviously, it's very upsetting because our kids are serving in the army. Our kids are fighting and the Palestinians are being killed and starving. And if this is a game, this is not only not legitimate, this is terrible. But who am I to say? I don't know what his intentions are, but I, I joined Dennis in suspecting that 
we don't see any specific plan of how to go ahead and take over Rafa. The Israeli public does not have an answer to this. And what's amazing, and also listening to what Dennis was saying, and 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 you know the the, the poll that you cited from JPVI is everybody's aligned in the need for this to be dealt with. Yes. And why are we not moving in that direction? You know, Dennis, I I, I do want to talk touch on the poll that you mentioned from yesterday, the Gallup poll, which made a lot of headlines across the U.S. You know, I mean, there's a lot there's a lot of questions that we there's a lot of what we could wonder why that's happening, right? And why there's been this steep decline in support for for Israel. Uh, and it's it's not so, you know, we've seen that steady decline since the beginning of this war. Is it the images that are coming out of Gaza? Is it the Netanyahu government? Is it the fact that this war is just not ending? Or is it that there's some trend that's taking place in the United States that really in the Democratic Party in particular, People will say it's the wokeism or, or whatever it might be, or the elections that's really changing this, or is it everything? I, I do have a feeling that it's a kind of a combination of all these things. Uh, you know, I do a lot of speaking on college campuses, uh, and for the last 15, 20 years, the BDS movement, the Justice for Palestine movement has created a set of, of uh, mantra, short talking points that sort of depict Israel as as part of this you know oppressive class that there's a they they have basically connected with the idea of intersectionality and they they have this worldview that they're connected to and that has been on the campuses and in faculties that basically talks about white privilege um you know a, a, oppressor and oppressed uh inequality uh, and those points, I think, were there, but never really struck a chord. Suddenly, the images coming out of Gaza made them more resonant. And so there's there's more of a following because of that. The we've seen, I think, the coverage in the in the American media again has become riveted on the on the images coming out of Gaza. Uh, and it made it, in a sense, it seemed to validate all those who wanted to castigate Israel and describe it a certain way. Uh, it certainly wasn't helped by having an Israeli government with extremist members in it like Smotrich and Ben Gavir, who basically want to expel the Palestinians. Uh, and so all that tended to come together. And what you have now is you, you have a real shift. I mean, I feel it. Uh, and I, I, I think it's obvious if you have a different Israeli government, that makes more of an effort to, you know, to emphasize what I would describe as historic Israeli values that have been the, the key to the, I really say they're the foundational element of the U.S.-Israeli relationship, which has always been based on shared values. Having an Israeli government that seems to embody those values, I think, will help. This is not going to be a quick turnaround, however. You know, when you, whenever you have a kind of uh, a slow process where attitudes are changing, and then they kind of flip for a reason, the ability to reverse that uh, is going to be, I think, quite limited. It doesn't mean you you don't make the effort. On the contrary, you have to make a very determined effort. You have to be very focused on it. You have to really elevate these, you know, these kinds of images and values. And you also have to, we have to do a collective job of also pointing out who shares these values and who doesn't. I mean, one of the things that is remarkable to me I am not indifferent to Palestinian suffering in Gaza, and I'm also someone who believes ultimately a one-state outcome is a disaster for Israel and is also a guarantee for a perpetual conflict because of the simple reality that you have two national movements with two separate national identities. They're not going to coexist in one state. Now, that doesn't mean two states is available anytime soon. It's not. But one of the reasons it's not available anytime soon is on the Palestinian side because the Palestinians, in a sense, at this point, may offer the slogans of support for, for a Palestinian state, but they do nothing to actually build a Palestinian state. You know, if, if one says that Palestinians have, as a people, have a right to a state, that also says at the same time, that has to be joined with, they also have to have the responsibilities. Right. And where are the examples of the responsibilities? And that's not just in terms of building the institutions of statehood, which they have not done, but it's also, Where's the manifestation of a genuine commitment to coexistence? 
where is the manifestation of accepting the historic Jewish connection to the land? If if there's a, a, a need and a desire to recognize that the Palestinians have a right to statehood, where is the effort to to acknowledge the legitimacy of Jewish peoplehood and Jewish nationhood? Uh, all this has to be part. If you're talking about Palestinian rights, it also has to be joined with Palestinian responsibilities. Today, here in the States, if you look at all the coverage, there's absolutely no discussion at all of Palestinian responsibilities. No. It's not even it's not even on the on the horizon. So there is an opportunity, I think, over time to again refocus attention, but it's going to require a very different presentation from Israel than we're currently seeing. And I can say just being on CNN this morning and being asked all about Albanese, the special rapporteur's uh, report accusing Israel of genocide, <laughs> that doesn't make for an easy conversation at all. Um, Yadidia, I want to ask you a similar question to what I just asked Dennis, and that is the Israeli people look at what's happening, right? And so they look at that poll of, of the decline in support, and they look at the rhetoric, and they look at the accusations of genocide, and they look at us being taken to The Hague, right, in the ICJ. And they say, it's, it's anti-Semitism, right? We stand alone, we're on our own, we have to do what's right for ourselves. It's not something that's gonna shift the conversation necessarily. And Israelis today and the post-October 7th world, still, despite the six months that have passed, or maybe because of the six months that have passed and the fact that hostages are still being held in Gaza, they still feel, we. I mean, I think we still feel that we are under attack. 100%, you have to realize, um... Shkaki, the poll star from the Palestinian people, came out last week with uh, astonishing and, uh, data saying that more than 70% of the Palestinians, not only in Gaza, but also in Judah and Samaria in the territories, more than 70% of them support Hamas. So every normal Israeli says, if we listen to the international community and we'll agree to a two-state solution, the other state will be immediately, immediately, Hamas state. And it's not only a national fight between two national movements. It's a religious conflict. They want to kill us because that's the way they understand their commitment to Islam. And Israelis do not agree to this period. It doesn't depend on Netanyahu or not Netanyahu. Right now we know that 80% of the Jews in Israel say that they do not see a chance for any kind of, uh, of peace negotiation in the foreseeable future with the Palestinians. 79%. So what you see is like two movements, the, the international community saying this is the only solution, and Israelis do not buy it. How can you blame them? If you know that your neighbors, it's not just a, not building uh, trust with us, they're saying Hamas is the right way. We want Hamas to be our leader. And you know that Hamas leaders are saying, well, we started the movement on the 7th of October, first wave. There will be a second, a third, a fourth, till we win. So Israelis want to, to live peacefully. Right now, they are aggressive. Israelis are aggressive towards any kind of, of compromise. They do not believe in it. And who can blame them? Who can blame them? This is reality. It's not going to disappear. It's another question. How can we, I mean, communicate this feeling in an honest way to the international community? And this is a job to be done. How can we go directly to, 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 to the world, to Americans and to the world and tell them, listen, listen to the Palestinians, what they say. Listen to what is their plan. This might eventually change the situation. I just want to say that we might be, Yaakov, right now in the midst of a process that will not, does not allow us to see it from perspective, wide perspective. The pendulum is moving. Hopefully it's moving all the way already and eventually it'll come back. Nobody knows, but I really hope so. And I think it's up to us, first of all, to be polite to our allies, Secondly, to come with a serious plan about how to finish it. Thirdly, to convince that this is existential issue, not to let Hamas take over the Palestinian movements, and we'll do everything we can do to eliminate this. I want to be cognizant of the time, and I just have a couple minutes left, but I want to ask both of you very quickly. 
So if you have Dennis, the ear of the president, and could give him advice that could try to lower the tension right now, what would that be? I mean, the main thing would be to reach and try to reach an agreement with Bibi uh, on what is the end game here? How do you define success? Uh, I've been trying to push for the idea that look, what we what we both understand is that there has to be a demilitarization of Gaza, which Israel is in fact succeeding in doing. Now, how do we let's let's discuss how much is enough? And what has to follow it to ensure that there can never be a remilitarization, number one, and number two, that Hamas can't be in control of Gaza. These, by the way, are the strategic objectives that Biden and Bibi share. Right. But it's got to be, but right now, the, it's at a level of generality without turning into, okay, let's come to an agreement on how much is enough. By the way, this is also how you can discuss Rafa. Okay, let's look at what has to be done. We know that the that, uh, 19 to the 24 battalions have been dismantled. Doesn't mean the Hamas fighters are all gone, but as an organized unit, as a military structure, as a military operation, as a, a weapons depots and the like, this is being largely dismantled. So you still have those four battalions there, one in the center. Let's agree on what constitutes enough and let's agree on what the next step is. One of Bibi's problems has been because of Ben Gavir and Smotrich, he's been hesitant to deal with what comes next. But it's really, you, you have an obligation, gets to, to what Yadidi was saying, you have an obligation to the IDF and to the forces that are fighting to make sure that the military operation results in a political outcome. If you don't have that political outcome, then you have, you've wasted what is this extraordinary effort and, and an unbelievable degree of heroism on the part of the people who are fighting this war. But right. you owe it to them to do that. What I'm suggesting is with Biden, you're pushing on an open door. He's willing to, to agree this is what the outcome is. So come to an understanding specifically on how you will define success together. This, you know, the more you, I hear BB say total victory, I don't know what it means. <laughs> it's a slogan. And now they're printing hats with it. And Yadidia, if you have the prime minister's ear here in Jerusalem, what would be the advice that you would give him on that same note? I would talk to his heart, not to his ear. If, if it's up to me, I'll obviously say that we need to go for election now. Israel needs election now. Obviously, there is no chance Bibi will hear to this, but this is what, what is needed. Why is it? We all assume in our discussion right now that we're dealing with Gaza, but maybe we we're just before the big war, not after the war. Maybe something is waiting for us in the north. And we know that this kind of conflict is going to be much more uh, demanding, to put it nicely, from, from Israel. The cost will be very high. And we need leadership that the Israelis trust when you go to such a big, big conflict. Right now, this is not the situation. It will be very bad if we will have to go to war with Lebanon, Hezbollah, and many Israelis will think in their mind, maybe it's because of an ulterior motive. We cannot afford to be in this situation. I think that we have to go to election. If maybe we will be re-elected, so be it. So he has a trust. And he can go to Biden and say, well, I represent the Israelis. But right now, he does not represent the Israelis by the polls. And I think we need to reassure ourselves and the international community that we have a leadership that we decide is the right leadership for the situation. That's why I call for elections. There is a high cost for election. Right now, solidarity in Israel is OK. And obviously, election will... will dismantle this solidarity. But nevertheless, it's a cost that should be paid right now in order to make us uh, uh, legitimate when we talk to the international community, when we talk to our enemies, and we, when we talk the internal discussion, which is the most important part. Very interesting. Dennis, uh, Ross, and Yadidia Stern, I want to thank both of you for joining us and to thank all our viewers and our listeners, wishing you all a safe and happy weekend and a Shabbat Shalom. We will be back here on the JPPI podcast on Monday and Thursday next week. In the meantime, thank you very much. Thank you, Yaakov. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you.